हेलो एवरी वन वेलकम टू दिस वीडियो वेर आई हैव विथ मी विवेक सो यू मैट हैव सीन विवेक इन मेनी ऑफ द प्रीवियस वीडियोज एंड वीकली मार्केट इन टी यू एंड ओवन इन एंड ओवन नैदरलैंड सो नाउ वी आर इन टी यू एंड ओवन कैंपस डू चेक द प्रीवियस वीडियो दैट वी डिड विथ विवेक वेर वी डिस्कस अबाउट हाउ ही अप्लाइड फॉर द पी एच डी फ्रॉम इंडिया डायरेक्टली टू नैदरलैंड वेर वी कवर्ड लॉट ऑफ डिफरेंट पॉइंट्स लाइक वट इज इज बैकग्राउंड हाउ डिड ही अप्लाई फॉर द पी एच डी हाउ वॉज द पी एच डी इंटरव्यू and how did he come to know about the position so everything is covered in that video it will be flashing on the screen uh, do check that video it is also in the i card in the right corner of the screen in this video specifically we'll be focusing only on his experience of doing the phd he's already finishing his second year right oh well i just finished my second year on 15th okay. of august okay so pretty much experience i guess uh, to talk about his position and also in general phd So he is a PhD in TU Eindhoven. Just to give you a context, and his PhD is in the Faculty of Applied Physics, and his exact research is on. Well, uh, it's basically more in the blend between physics and mathematics. I work on quantum. Yeah, math- some mathematical aspects of quantum physics and also molecular simulation. That main part is molecular simulations. Okay. Okay. Then we can start the interview with the first question. Like what is the topic of your PhD? So and then we can move on to different points. Okay, that is actually the most difficult question that always comes across. What's the topic? Because I try to explain it to even in the shortest way, and everybody can understand. Understand. So basically, uh, you have uh, solar panels, and then you have uh, some organic molecules that are being studied to be used in solar panels. And those orga- organic molecules, like how charge transfer happens, they are described by But then you cannot simulate uh, quantum, uh, quantum mechanically like thousands of atoms or molecules because it's computationally just not feasible. So what they do is like they also do some classical physics, like solving how where the atoms move and how it moves and how it relaxes and things like that. So there is a bridge between the two. Okay. I basically in my first part, first two years of my PhD, I was actually linking the bridge between the two, and now because I have my codes that actually links the bridge i can continue further with my simulations to run how the charge transfer happens in those molecules so it's basically in short in two words molecular simulations That's okay what do. moving on to the next questions about the phd we want to make it as generic as possible about the experience of phd and you and over in the lens uh, how is the phd atmosphere according to you like maybe taking example like opportunities to network grow as a researcher attend the conferences or some such things yes okay so here mostly like your day to day work experience actually uh, it depends on the kind of group that you are in how interactive you are with your supervisor how helpful he is how your work colleagues are because you need a lot of help, help from your colleagues they exist because so mm-hmm. that they can help you and you help them that's how it works and about networking and conferences uh, that is okay if you doing a phd in india then you have a really good conference at some somewhere in europe or something like that like you really have to arrange separate funds for it and there is a minuscule chance that you will make it but here like i am in the netherlands right now if i know that oh amazing conference going on on the other side of germany then which i had to go to dresden actually but then corona happened so i didn't go but then i i know that a uh, amazing conference is going on like 500 kilometers away from where i live i can immediately just just i don't require a visa i don't require just mention it to my supervisor and go yeah okay, sometimes to go to the us and things like that you need some advance planning but okay for conferences i've traveled to a few countries already which is actually I think, really difficult living in india so this is actually a very big difference i think like funding wise it is much easier here yeah. when you are, have assigned to a project or yeah Don't have any shortage or constraint of the budget. No, uh, yeah, in the budget, like it's already allocated. That this much is for travel and things like that. Mm-hmm. So you already know. And more, yeah. more than that, it's the paperwork. Because to come from India to Europe mm-hmm. to attend a great conference, you, the amount of paperwork and things, yeah. embassies that you have to go through is like, is it even worth it? Okay. And any summer schools? Did you rec- attend or do you recommend of attending summer schools during your PhD? Uh, yes, I do recommend. I did it for two months, so it's not compulsory, but it's nice to actually because it also gives you more exposure to 
people you get to know their teacher can teach you networking and all that. so yeah definitely go out and make the most of whatever opportunities you have okay uh, okay so talking about the salary which many people ask apart from the research because here phd is a job i have repeated that many times in the video still people ask me do you get scholarship do you get money to study just to do a phd one sentence like yeah. if there is no fund or if there is no money available you there is no phd position here yeah. that's how it is that, that's what i also say many times so you are so, bound to get money if you come here for phd yeah so yeah so what salary range do we get as a phd uh, because my salary is different because he uh, directly came from india to netherlands so he gets a 30% ruling so his salary is bit higher as compared to a phd who doesn't get a 30% ruling so maybe he will give a rough range of how much you can expect to earn each month on a net salary basis and it also changes each year like yeah, your salary is incremented I want to talk about it. so for, first when you start off hmm. Uh, if you have the, I'll only talk about if you have the thirty percent rule because I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. That's yeah. so. If you have the thirty percent rule when you start off, um, you are somewhere around two k euros per month. Okay. Somewhere. In that is the net. That is the net after your tax deduction and everything, and then uh, from the first to the second year, the increase is too high. It's a lot, yeah, three hundred, four hundred euros depending on the amounts you get. Then from third, uh, second to third is not. It's still a uh, slight Very increase. Low. Yeah, uh, 100 euros or 150 euros, and then third goes so again a little bit. So okay. you can expect to earn around 2,000 net in the first year, to 2,700 net in the final year, around okay. that range in that thing when you have 30%. Okay. So that's actually decent. Yeah, that's. I mean, as a single person, that's more than sufficient. I would say. Uh, yeah. So normally PhDs here are. Part of a project, like sometimes it is like I know some PhDs they do like half of their uh, hours in the university, half in industry, some do entirely in the industry. So it's there are different types of PhDs. So what is your PhD? How what is the nature of your PhD? Is it like only university, only industry, or is it a mix? Or? Yeah, okay. I'm collaborating with the E Science Center, uh, which is actually a national science. Uh, National government body actually for science that uh, promotes uh, codings and things like that in the university. Like you have an idea, you want to code it. E science will provide you engineers. It is from Netherlands. From the Netherlands, okay. yes. E science center in the Netherlands. So basically, I'm I'm collaborating with them, and it's a kind of a like it's not an industrial PhD. It has nothing to do with industry. We are basically working on the development of software with the e science people, and uh, I'm also my my major part is implementation and testing of the software. So yeah, so again, the the although the salary there is a scale which remains same depending on whether you get or don't get thirty percent ruling, but uh, some the nature of the workload of the PhD sometimes it has a slight variation depending on which university you are from, how much uh, research load or uh, optional coursework you need to do, or you don't do at all. So. What is your experience like? Uh, do you have any additional responsibility during your PhD, uh, like teaching or grading or doing some course for your personal improvement? Or? Basically, uh, in the Netherlands, uh, I don't know what other universities, but for me, like I have to spend ten percent of my total research time in teaching. Okay. So I have to like every year I have to take uh, two courses, like not I have to like be be the uh, teaching assistant for two courses. Where my duty will be like in the tutorials when the students are there, like I help them for so whatever they have, and then grade exams at the end. Like I get a proper exams and I grade sometimes. And sometimes it's just a small scale class where there are not many students, but it's better to myself. If it's a large class, I get it. So for the first, uh, how they arrange it here is that uh, they arrange it so that in your final year you don't get any teaching tasks. So in the first three years, yes, every year I have to do two courses. I have to take two courses, and for personal development, yes, uh, there are a lot of proof courses here. Uh, the name is proof, P R O O F, but then they are basically for your personal development. They have really nice, uh, how do I say, some courses that uh, like, for example, giving audience focus presentation. That's really scientific integrity. That's I think compulsory. Scientific integrity is compulsory to do to graduate as a PhD. And then there are more like uh, uh, writing skills and things like that. And 
some, some things that really help you to get through, kick start your PhD, how to be with your supervisor and things like that. That's basically the external extra load actually. Okay. So normally the PhDs here is like uh, you make some publications and later in plain words if you say it's like you compile those publications in different chapters and form a meaningful coherent story which will be like your thesis or the book that you are writing at the end of your PhD. So it also varies from department to department and university to university. So in your case do you need to have any specific number of publications before writing the PhD thesis? Or how is the PhD thesis re written? Is it same as I described? Uh, what's your experience? Firstly, there's no written rule that says you need to have this many publications. It's kind of just not written, like yeah, somewhere uh, three, four, uh, like a few. Even like if you have two, sometimes yeah, you could. There's no, also it depends on the quality of publication. Like to get one nature publication really requires three years of hard work to uh, get into it. So it does not only depend on the number of publications, but yeah, it's an unset rule that one should be three publications. Yeah, so the main topic of the PSD, uh, before that we'll wrap our jackets, it's feeling colder. So moving on to the main part of the PhD, uh, probably I should also remove the sun. <laughs> <laughs> They're not necessary anymore. <laughs> uh, going to the main part of the PhD, that is the supervision because you are here you need a good team you need a good team of supervisors mentors uh, peers so how is the phd supervision based on your experience till now in the two years and uh, how important is the supervision team's contribution for your mental growth research growth as a whole your phd do you find it helpful or do you think that after a certain period of time you can become independent and you can manage without them maybe towards the end? So what's your experience? Okay. Yeah, firstly, being independent is actually a nice thing, but there will be points in your PhD where what do I do next? How do I use this? How do I implement the code? Somebody else has written the code. I don't understand anything about it. So that's when like your supervisor and your peers and your colleagues come to play. And I think I mentioned it in the previous video as well and some minutes before as well. I came here because I really liked uh, how the supervisor approached the project, how he think. He really had a visual clarity actually about the simulation that we're going to. So that is, I've been really lucky in that sense to work in an amazing group. Great peers, they're like funny and they're also, apart from like just from work, even outside work, they're like amazing people. And even at work, they're knowledgeable. They have, uh, we go to conferences together sometimes. We think so. Yeah, it's really nice to have a group of people who actually know things and can help you out. And then yes, when you grow up, uh, like now I'm in the third year of my PhD. Now a new newbie comes in, then I'm definitely gonna help and support them. So that's how it works. Knowledge and, and sometimes people ask this very often, like how often? I mean, it also varies from person to person, university to university. How often can you? Uh, meet your maybe daily supervisor or the professors promoters so what is your uh, in your case or is it like there's no strict uh, okay uh, with me i think i can uh, it, it okay in so general now it, I think <laughs> it depends on <laughs> it depends on like how busy or in how many involvements your supervisors in your daily supervisors my promoter uh, is a busy person i've not met him many times my daily supervisor, the one who interviewed me and things like that, I have met him like you meet every day, not during these times, but in general, he has his office right beside mine, like in the office that where we sit. So, like, everyone we have lunch together every once in a while, in an hour or two, he comes walking by and, like, ah, how are you guys doing? and he just sits and have a chat. And then, so if I ever have a problem, I definitely have to go. And then, if not, face to face, I just send him, uh, send him something via Slack or something like that. So, to be honest, I've been lucky in that sense. Okay. So, what did you like and dislike till now for doing a PhD in that sense? Like, first of all, I like the professors again. I like the professors. They're amazing. And uh, the workload is also nice. Uh, I basically know what I'm doing. So, yeah. For dislike, okay. Not many things, but given the scenario now, I have to sit at home and work and, and 
also given the nature of my work because I think I can work from home and it's not necessary that I so yeah even the university is a bit skeptical to reinstate me back into the thing so the thing is like yeah with my nature of work it's nice I can still function working but then uh, like being at home my efficiency at the, in the last four months has gone down so but yeah that's one thing that I dislike right now but otherwise not really I don't have much complaints Okay, so uh, maybe to give an idea to people who are start, who will be starting PhD or who are starting PhD, uh, what are the few major challenges you faced during your PhD from which you want to tell someone before so that they also know okay, they can expect this? Okay, so firstly, uh, first piece of advice, like choose your supervisors and group, like be very thorough with who you want to go to work with. Yeah, you may have a big name on, on the board. Like yeah, this guy is amazing, and you—it's very tempting to go and work. But then, like, or maybe he's even a Nobel laureate. You make, <laughs> but then, that's a different issue. But then, like, the amount of time that he will be able to devote to you, or she will be able to devote to you, will be really low. Because given that thing, a new PhD, so yeah. So then, be very careful with uh, who you choose to work with. It need not be a big brand, but if uh, the person works with you, struggles with you, writes the codes with you, or like does the experiments with you, hand in hand, definitely gonna learn. No doubt about it. That's one challenge, and then you know, once you get started, like yeah, uh, if you have never written a paper before, you are gonna face downsides. There will be times when like uh, you will write a paper and uh, it's all out of, it's of no sense. Now you write again, and writing is a bit of a challenge. And towards the end, I think writing a thesis will be a challenge again. Okay. Which I've not experienced. I've experienced a master thesis, but not PhD. I'll see how it is. Okay. So yeah, start writing the, like the papers that you write while. Make, try making the story beforehand before you actually enter into your final year and mm -hmm. that's the thing. Okay. Okay, so we are almost approaching the end of the video. If you think the video is long, you will find video chapters and timestamps in the description below. So take the help of those features on YouTube. And uh, moving on to the last two questions. Uh, what is your experience of post PhD opportunities in your field? after PhD here or maybe in Europe like or maybe what is your take on it like people can go for postdoc or research or consultancies or uh, uh, whether going for job so whatever you have heard maybe you can just give some yeah okay so basically uh, there are a lot of options actually uh, because I've lived here for two years uh, so I know I've seen my senior PhDs go to work and things like that ASML is a master recruiter of Philips. Is there. I, I have a friend who works in uh, Signify and the lighting section of Philips. So you can definitely go to industry. I think There's Philips no will be somewhere uh, around that. Maybe if you go around the center, you see the Philips building. Because I know when it's, yeah, it's the... uh, Philips was started here. So uh, you can definitely go to TNO, is one of them. Yeah, you can definitely go to companies. I, I know friends who have done postdocs. Mm -hmm. uh, one of, one of the postdocs in our group was actually PhD from Germany and now he's doing, he had done a postdoc thing and even after postdoc they go and join like research centers and the research centers that you can actually join. So the options after PhD is not minuscule or something, you have a large number of options, you can do whatever you want but yeah, PhD, this experience is like worth it, four years. Okay. So, what is your interest? Like, do you want to go in academia or do you want to go in the job market or you have not yet decided? Well, okay. Academia, is, it's fine, it's fascinating, but somehow I, I somehow want to like uh, go up and try my skills in the real world and see where it is. So, I might want to go for R&D uh, sector for some company or something like that. Okay. That is all. So, uh, in one summer school, if I am not wrong, we did one workshop about the work-life balance of a PhD. Normally, uh, as people say, most people say, because people always see it on the negative, on the bad side. I would not say it bad, but the negative side. Like that, how can you say that a PhD has a work-life balance? None of the PhDs have a work-life balance. I don't agree to that point, but I want to hear about what is Vivek's opinion considering the two years of his PhD. Uh, so, do you really have a work-life balance? Do you have a good social life? What is your experience? Like, how is your social life or work-life balance? Okay. Let's start with, firstly, the Netherlands. Uh, here, to find a social life after your high school is actually difficult. Like, even the Dutch find it difficult. It's not nothing to do with your friends outside. So, uh, but 
but then in that respect uh, the easier way is like you pick up an interest like you want to play music okay perfect you want to uh, play a sport that's amazing you so pick up a inter- interest or something and you socialize with the group over there and you'll find many friends along the way like uh, i've been living here for 2 years i have found many friends along many indians many people from abroad and like yeah i often it's not like i don't have a social life because i often go out for parties in the evenings and things like that with friends my colleagues are amazing we go out uh, we are planning to go on a trip and i uh, travel like in in number of countries i forgot so and i also do photography so it's not like we don't <laughs> Each country that I visited can be found on my Instagram. Yeah, he's a. Yeah, yeah, Baki da. Yeah, Baki da. We have a lot of audience who are cheering us, just like a big show because it's unscripted, but people are supporting us. Oh. So we cannot show you, but uh, they are already shouting. So we are nearing to the end of the video. But the thing is that he's a very good photographer. I learned some tips also from him. So do check his Instagram and uh, maybe follow him. to get advice just like peter mckinnon he's a very good photographer and editor so that's <laughs> a bit overkill but yeah but uh, coming to the main question yeah. you do have a social life it's not like that it's not you totally engrossed in work but the 8 hours of work that you have 9 to 5 10 to 6 that's flexible depends on you and your supervisor is 8 hours of work and after that yeah you have your life so basically you can party every day or every yeah. weekend just, just be there in office when you so you can party all night and then Say you don't turn up to us. Sense. I, I, I play sports here, so it's really nice. And you also pick up a lot of friends by sports. It's okay. It's, you definitely, it's not a compromise. Trust me. Okay. So yeah. So I think we talked about so many points, and we also used a lot of time of busy schedule. <laughs> okay. Don't forget to smash the like button if you have not smashed it, and share this video with all your friends. Uh, Just remember to subscribe to the channel. It mot motivates. कहाँ से आ रहा है? Subscribe to the channel if you have not subscribed yet. And see you in more vlogs. If you like it, then comment below. If you want to see more videos coming up from Abhijit and Vivek, we'll show you more videos about you and Owen or other experiences of an expat or Indian living in Netherlands. And see you in upcoming vlogs. Till then, bye. ठंडा लग रहा है काउंट डाउन